Welcome to Alternative Dog Moms Podcast. I'm Kimberly Gautier, the creator of Keep the Tail Wagging. For the past nine years, I've been blogging about raw feeding, pet wellness, and life as a crazy dog mom. I've seen massive improvements in my dog's health since I started raising my dogs naturally, and I'm passionate about sharing my experience to help other pet parents. I'm Erin Scott. For the past nine years, I've been researching and learning everything I can about healing cancer, allergies, autoimmune, and mystery illnesses in both my dogs and myself, and I can't wait to share with you everything I've learned on this journey. As the Alternative Dog Moms, we're bringing you all the latest dog health news that we're following and sharing the tips, tricks, and resources we learn along the way. Now, let's get started. Hello, Kimberly. Hello, Erin. So we are joined today by Daniel Shuloff, who is the founder and CEO of Keto Natural Pet Food Company. So Daniel, welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, we've had a chance to talk a little bit before we got on uh, recording, and it's very nice to talk to you ladies. And uh, I'm excited about the conversation that we'll have going forward. Oh my gosh, I have so much ground I want to cover here. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a lot, you know, when I, this is the first time we've all chatted together, there will be a million things. We could probably do this for five hours. If we, I, <laughs> I would, I would imagine. So keto, are you the only keto company as far as pet food company out there? So there is, um, we make at present the only truly low carbohydrate kibble product, like other, the next lowest after ours, which is like 5% carbohydrate is in the like high teens, 20s, that kind of thing. And it's part of a product line typically that's usually much higher than that. There are no other brands that actively like have branded themselves as keto, like as part of their actual corporate branding. There's one other called Visionary Pet Foods that makes primarily raw products that uses the keto prefix and the language of ketogenic and that kind of stuff in some places. And they actually used to make a kibble as recently. And they like, I'm not sure it's even accurate to say they don't make it anymore, but if nothing else, it hasn't been available for a period of about a year. Um, and that used to be like, I would describe to people, it's us and them on an Island and then everybody else. They were the only other one that was like truly low in carbohydrate content, but that's, okay. it's still relatively, underused as compared to the human side of the like consumer products world where there's keto everything. Right. And what made you come up with the keto kibble? Because I actually thought that that would be an impossibility because of the nature of kibble and what we're always told about kibble. Um, well, the reason I thought there would be um, a business in it is that I guess it seemed like a very good product for somebody that like me, like I would have bought that product if it existed before I founded my company. And the longer answer is I spent four years writing a book about why dogs in America are so fat. It's like a, a strange little subtopic that ended up completely changing my life. And uh, it took, like I said, four or five years to write it, 400 page book. And at the end of the day, the main conclusion scientifically speaking there's kind of like a whole social part of it too but like scientifically it's like the problem of obesity is entirely because the pet food industry in the u.s today is built around dietary carbohydrate and if you uh, don't want your dog to get fat you shouldn't feed it carbohydrate and so i was kind of like by the time i was done with that book more or less a one issue shopper but i've always had large dogs my entire life and I believe because of, uh, for a cluster of reasons, I would prefer it all else being equal to be able to buy a complete and balanced pet food product from the store as opposed to trying to create a recipe on my own. And so for me, the options have always been, if I want, before Keto Natural came along, was like, you're going to have to feed a raw diet, either raw frozen, raw freeze dried, something like that. And the price is considerable for a lot, you know, it's like I always say to we have customers that have tiny dogs. And we have customers that have large dogs. My dog, Wayne, is a Saint, male St. Bernard that weighs 165 pounds. And so he eats something like 10 times as much food every day as a really small dog does. And so the percentage-based difference in price for like between a high-quality, very low-carbohydrate, high-meat-protein raw diet 
and a kibble with the same nutritional composition is like a 5x, 8x type thing in, in my experience. And so for a small dog, you might be talking about the difference between 30 cents a day and a few bucks a day. Very large dog gets quite different. So it's like if somebody made a low carbohydrate, but kibble style product, I would buy that and I would feed that to my dogs. And so I was, I lived in the same world that you're describing, Kimberly, where I was like, it's always sort of been accepted in the course of writing my book. Well, you need carbohydrate to make kibble. Yeah. It's part of how, that's how you get the dough to hold together. And that, that is true. Yeah. That's like, um, if you want to bake a, a muffin without much carbohydrate, you struggle, right? Because if you don't mm -hmm. put flour in the dough, when you heat it up, the dough crumbles. It doesn't want to hold together. That's like what the starchy carbohydrate does. It gelatinizes, it holds it all together. But we're fortunate enough to live in an era where because folks primarily on the human nutritional side of the equation have realized that carbohydrate do a variety of nasty things to the human body, there are all kinds of human low-carb products that are out there. And so folks who do food engineering stuff have come up with reasonable workarounds that are like ways to get nutritional products to hold together effectively, both techniques and as a matter of like content, what types of ingredients you're using that get it to hold together reasonably well. It's not going to be a beautiful biscuit every time, but like you can find keto bread, you can find like keto ice cream bars, that kind of stuff that like needs to bind. It's just like other folks have kind of done some of the homework. And so we were able to start from there. And then it took about a year of a lot of trial and error of trying to get it right, trying to get something where it would hold together, but like getting the carbohydrate content as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So take us back to your book, Dogs, Dog Food and Dogma. How did you become interested in this topic in the first place? You know, most of us uh, listening, I would imagine, come to it because our dog had like a health issue or something like that. Um, is that what brought you to this topic? Sort of, but it wasn't like an acute health issue, if that makes sense. Like I got my first dog and back then I was still uh, a lawyer. I didn't do anything professionally having to do with dogs, but I got a dog and I'd like been raised with uh, my mother had dogs. And so I always had dogs throughout my childhood, but then I went off to college and law school and lived on my own and never had one. And then when I was in my like mid twenties, I guess, got my first dog of my own. It was a Rottweiler, super cool dog really intense dog, like very Rottweilery Rottweiler. And I was this like busy single dude. And I knew that like, I, I learned <laughs> that he needed like exercise to be a polite member of society, not just like to behave in a way I could like, I don't know, like Caesar Milani type, like I need my dog to do what I tell it to do, but like a liability, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like a safety issue that my 110 pound Rottweiler is not going to bite somebody. And so I got very into like exercising him and trying to do that well and effectively led me to read science about it. And that's how I just like learned about the issue of obesity in dogs. And then it was like, well, wait a second, is my dog obese? And it was like, well, no, but it does seem like he falls into this like larger category. That's like millions of dogs in America today, where it's like, the science says if you want it to live longer, it shouldn't be this fat. It's not mm -hmm. obese, but it's fatter than it ought to be if you want it to live a really long time. And I fancied myself a smart, like well-informed dog owner. And it was just like, how the heck, how did I let this happen? Like if I'm letting this happen, who does not And it just like became interesting to me. And it was like half the dogs in the country are suffering from more than half are suffering from this disease. And it seems like the kind of thing that, pet owners would be able to super easily control. Like, it's just like super straightforward, right? You figure out what, how you're going to take care of the dog. You feed it, whatever it needs. Like if I had, if somebody was like, well, Dan, you're never going to get to choose what you eat for yourself. doesn't matter if it tastes good or whatever. Somebody else is just going to put it in front of you and you got to eat what they give you. I don't think I would struggle to like maintain optimal body composition. Like I wouldn't have that. That's a challenge for people, right? Like we, we know that some foods are delicious and it's a struggle not to eat them. And, but that's not the case with dogs. And it's like, how could this, this is this horrible thing. It's worse for them than smoking, but it's so common. What is that? And I just like set out to try to answer that question for myself. And it revealed itself as a super interesting story. And I couldn't run the answer down until I started getting into 
like essentially why people believe what they believe about the nutritional significance of carbohydrate. And then it sort of started falling into line. And it was like a lot of that research on the human side was being done at that time. And so I was able to like draw on the stuff that was coming out of there and it just became super, super interesting and just drew me in. And uh, I quit my job <laughs> and spent four <laughs> years working on it and traveling all around to interesting places that are relevant to the book. Um, and by the time, like I said, like wh when I was finishing it, like it, um, since carbohydrate is like the devil of the book, by the time I was getting near the end of it, I was like, oh, this should be a bigger thing in pet food. I bet you I could do this. If I could mm -hmm. figure out a way to make kibble without carbohydrate, that would be a valuable product that people would get like that would be good for people and their dogs. And so it was sort of like by the time the book was published, I was like, I'm going to next thing I'm going to do is try to make a business for people that read this and find it compelling or come to these thoughts on their own. So I understand that you're like an ultra marathoner and really into your own health as well. Do you follow? Well, I am an ultra marathon. I, I um, my favorite <laughs> sweatshirt by comfort it, it also happens to have the logo for this very uh, hoity-toity race that I did last year on it, which is the Ultra Trail Mont Blanc. It's this big deal in the running community. It took me forever to get into it. It's over in France. And so, yeah, I do that. That's like, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and the mountains are very close. And so my fiance and I and our dogs are very into outdoor recreation. And yeah, one of the things that I do is these really, really absurdly long races. Um, so are you keto? No, I'm not. I Like, here's how I constantly describe it is like i believe that it is a very efficacious like health healthful diet for a lot of people and arguably for everybody however i also have like hobbies in my life where it will decrease the quality of your performance 100 percent. like there are things that are relevant to most endurance sports that are you want to be able to do well that you're burning carbohydrate in and like your body only stores a certain amount of it. And you will, what's called in the endurance sports world bonk. If you don't, that's like a, or hit the wall is something mm -hmm. here in marathoning. It's the same phenomenon that's being described. It's like your body stores a certain amount of glucose, which is like the simplest carbohydrate that it uses for energy. And you, or if you're running hard enough, like it's like a continuum where it's like, if you're just walking, like grandma pace walking, you're not burning almost any glucose. Your body uses fat instead. It burns that fat really efficiently. But the faster you go, the more the needle swings the other way to the glucose side. And so if you're carrying a certain pace for long enough, you use it all up and you need to put more back in because your body has a limited quantity of it. It stores it in the skeletal muscles and the liver. That's it. And you'll run out. And so I can't do that. You like it. I've had friends who also believe in the efficaciousness of keto diets for their own health, who have like brought their trail snack as like a very keto thing, thinking like, well, no, I'm going to eat, but I'm keto. And so I'm, and it doesn't, that is not a thing. And it produces <laughs> bad outcomes where people get stuck on trails in bad shape. So yeah, I do it for that. And then the other aspect of it is like, one of the great things about keto diets that I believe is, is a really important thing as a matter of public health is that like you would not have a human obesity problem if everybody ate a keto diet. You just like it is almost it is you can lose weight a bunch of different ways. If you come into like a story fat, you can lose weight a bunch of different ways, exercise, whatever. You can't make somebody obese unless you feed them carbohydrates. So if, like, if it, everybody ate a keto diet, they'd all be quite lean. But if you do 20 plus hours of running a week, it is hard to eat through that too. And so, yeah, I do eat. I like, I believe in the healthfulness of it, but I also don't really struggle to like keep my weight where I want it to, to be. So a lot of people, um, both in the human space and the pet space who do not understand what keto is. And sadly in this time, people usually go for the easiest answer. So um, when I first started hearing about keto, it was likened to the Atkins diet. It, people just call it, oh, it's just a low carb diet and you just don't eat many carbs and you eat more fat. Can you like debunk that and explain exactly what keto is? Frankly, I don't think they're that different. Well, go, go ahead, Erin. I, I, I learned it as high fat, moderate protein, low carb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think of it this way. It's like, I, I actually think of like, when you say Atkins, I'm like, yeah, that's basically more or less like it's not perfectly there are distinctions i'll get to in a second but like 
eh, it's not really like they're like hugely different. Mm -hmm. So keto diet refers to a cluster of metabolic phenomena that all begin with the prefix keto. Ketones are a type of metabolic substrate that your body produces, your dog's body produces. And just like certain tissues in your body or your dog's body rely on glucose in certain instances to fuel, to power their, their needs, they can rely on ketone bodies as well. They're, they're just like a subset. And they get produced endogenously within the body in certain conditions. And those conditions tend like the, the, the most notable ones are outright starvation. If you're not taking in any food whatsoever, if you are fasting, your body tends to ramp up ketone production. But also, if you mimic some of the, the conditions present when you're fasting, that same phenomenon tends to happen. And so keto diet kind of refers to the type of diet that'll lead your body or your dog's body to produce more ketones than it otherwise would. Okay. Um, and so those, the two main dietary qualities that tend to deepen or maximize ketosis, ketosis is the word for like the process of making ketone bodies, are reducing carbohydrate as much as possible and increasing fat kind of as much as possible as well without like being alongside, obviously if you eat like a very high carbohydrate, high fat, like if you eat cake has a lot of fat in it, but that is not a, <laughs> a, a deep in ketosis, but medium chain triglycerides are like a kind of fat that has been shown to deepen ketosis, both in dogs and in people. And so a keto diet is in a literal technical sense is like any diet that tends to increase the ketosis that's going is put you into a ketogenic state. Um, but it's a continuum, just like I was describing before that there's like a spectrum when you're, what your body will use metabolically to power different activities. It's not like you often see discussed in the, like the, the lay literature, like the lay media, what I think of as a spectrum is being like a flip the switch. You're burning fat or you're burning carbohydrate. And if you do this, you're going to burn fat. If you do this, you're going to be in carbohydrate. Really, it's just a fractional thing where it's like at any point you're burning some amount of one and some amount of the other. And ketosis is kind of similar. It's like even at a high carbohydrate intake, your body's making some amount of ketone bodies or your dog's body, but some things deepen it significantly. And so those things are like eliminate carbohydrate, and increase medium chain triglycerides, which is a kind of fat. So those are the dietary qualities that tend to do that. So that's kind of what keto diet means. So Jackson and I did a really strict keto diet for several months, um, about two years ago. My husband lost about 40 pounds and he did really, really well on it. And for, if, with him losing 40 pounds made him like very thin, like, you know, like, no, like people were like, you're really thin, <laughs> you know? And it did not work as well for me. Like I did not feel as good. So it was just so interesting, like how your body chemistry can be different. Yeah. And your activity, activity is a super big thing. Like what's your lifestyle? Like, you know, no two people. We're not all marathoners over here. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is weird. It's like, well, I mean, this is a digression, but yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's like there, these things are not panaceas and people have very different individual reactions to it. So you had referenced a study in the book, and I'm going to um, pull this out and put it in the show notes. And Kimberly, this actually kind of goes a little bit with what we were talking about last week with the zoo pharmacognosy. Mm -hmm. So it's basically saying that like when given the opportunity for dogs to self-select their own food, that they tend to go for 63% fat, 30% protein, 7% carb, and that that's essentially a ketogenic diet that, and that there's been like numerous studies that have been done that replicate these kinds of findings. And, and that just kind of blew my mind. That is fascinating because the other day I was filming the dogs for real and I filmed Bella eating and I always find it interesting what they eat first, like what order they eat, because my dogs rarely just eat and just until the bowl is clean, they, they go from one food to the next. And she started with the muscle meat, but quickly went to the fish and finished off the fish, finished off the egg, then went back and finished the muscle meat, then had the bone 
as the last. And I put wheatgrass because of the, <laughs> the conversation we had last week. The wheatgrass was the last thing that she ate and she, she finished it all and she cleaned her bowl. But I always find it interesting just as far as, you know, people will ask me with so many people coming into the raw feeding community this year, a lot of people don't understand why I add different things to the meal. And the reason why is because even the, even if I'm doing a commercial raw, I like to have that fatty fish. I like to have the egg in there because to me, my dogs do better on a diet that looks that way rather than a diet that is just a hundred percent, you know, um, I mean, it's balanced if it's commercial, but you know, meat, bone and organ meat. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Yeah, an interesting, you know, I guess I have two reactions to uh, er, to the, this kind of subject. One is, Aaron, yeah, the study you're talking about, I actually came across again recently in my personal reading. There's a human nutrition and science book that I was reading. That I think it's called Eat Like the Animals. It's basically a, uh, a advocacy for what's called the protein leverage hypothesis, which is the idea that you have, your, that all animals have a like internal barometer for protein intake that like what we call hunger is really separate appetites that that your body is hungry for something specific and that everybody on has a thermostatic kind of thing where they they're all taking in a specific and they talk about this body of evidence uh concerning dogs and and show as if you know in order to support the point that that same kind of thing is going on in there but what it made me aware of is this broader phenomenon which is that the like corporatization of veterinary nutritional science, the influence of industry in that domain is, you know, unprecedented in the already corporatized American social uh, environment. But uh, it really didn't start becoming a thing to like the 1980s. And that's when it kind of like grew up. And, because those the companies that do the most to influence the veterinary nutrition community and the study of veterinary nutrition subjects in America make products that are so dependent upon dietary carbohydrate, you see if you look at like the intro, this is not really a point I make in the book, like before that period and then like in, to some degree after that period, but it trails off, you find all these interesting studies about stuff that for one reason or another isn't great for carbohydrate. And so like a study like this one where it's like, oh, these dogs only took in 7% carbohydrate, regardless of what that ultimately tells you about dogs, it's like, well, okay, something here, they don't really want this. Why? And mm-hmm. it's like, that's the kind of study that in 2024, you will not see being performed because oh, at no. this point, the dominance within that industry is ubiquitous. It's like you cannot do that as a job in America today, being the kind of scientists who run studies designed to understand veterinary nutrition topics. You can't do that unless you take money from industry, period, full stop. There are not exceptions to that. That is the only serious career sustaining source of income or source of funding for that kind of work. And so it's just like not being done anymore. So you'll see like that kind of stuff. It's all a little older, a little. And so then the other interesting, maybe this is interesting type thing that uh, I had as a reaction to what you're saying, Kimberly, is that one of the parts of the research uh, I did when I was writing the book is I went to Yellowstone National Park, which now is very close to where I live, actually. It's only four or five hours away. And you watch the wolves. I, I watch the wolves. Ah. And what, and so it, which is super cool, as you could imagine, very smart, interesting people that spend their lives and, and careers studying them. But one of the things that you see, uh, so wolves and dogs are different. So folks have teased out the genetic sequence, like the genome of dogs and wolves very carefully. You guys probably know all this stuff already, but just in case, two main things are different between, they're incredibly similar, right? They're so similar, they can breed with one another, which is like, 
maybe they're even the same species, arguably. It like blurs the line between species. You know what I mean? Like, in a, a ra- that's like how biologists often define the line between species. Like, can they breed together? Dogs and wolves, very similar. Two things different. One, brain, like wolf, just you, you can raise a wolf um, just like you're raising a dog. It is not going to become temperamentally the same as the kind of animal that is sleeping on my couch right now, in most cases. Second is starch digestion. And that's like the ability to digest, turn nutritional uh, carbohydrate based nutrition, starch into energy. Dogs have evolved the ability to do that. Like people have wolves have not. And so wolves don't, they don't make enough of the like enzymes that it's called amylase. That amylase. Your body uses, yep. To break it down. So I wolves, just wrote an article about this, um, this weekend. So I'm like, so loving this topic. Use this anecdote or like update your case. You maybe you have used it already, but like one of the distinctions for that is like wolves can't eat any carbohydrate. They like, they, they, it's not that it's like they self-select away from it. It's like eating a piece of plastic for them. It doesn't become calories for them. And so what you will find if you follow the, enough wolves around is you'll find these carcasses where they've a big ungulate, a moose or an elk or bison or whatever they've taken down. And they're incredibly good because they live in packs, right? They eat an obscene amount whenever this happens. And there's a number of animals. So they pick over like the entire carcass. They eat like the hide. They eat most of the bones except for like the big pelvic bones or whatever. But what you will find amid all these like the big bone parts of the skeleton is what's called the root, the contents of the rumen of the animal. Like these animals, mm-hmm. elk and bison and thing, they eat plant matter exclusively and they have a weird digestive infrastructure that they need to break that stuff down. And what it produces is like wad of plant matter. That's just like a huge fermenting wad of grass in every elk. And when wolves pick over that, you'll find the stomach or the rumen lining eaten, but that wad is just sitting in there. And that's like their way. This is a long winded way of saying that's their way of self-selecting. Yeah. That's like they, they do what Kimberly's dogs do, or they leave something for last, but they just like can't even digest that stuff. So they just leave it entirely. Which brings back the, you know, the argument that we've always had in the raw feeding community of, you know, wolves, oh, well, they eat the stomach contents of their prey. And that's no. always like the the back and forth um, as people try to justify. That's not a um, thing. Yeah, that justify feeding vegetables to dogs. And it's just, and it's one of those things where when I was new to raw feeding, you know, it's so overwhelming. It's so confusing. Do I do this? Do I not do this? And my argument was always, well, my dogs do produce, you know, amylase in the pancreas. And so they can consume um, plant matter. It's just not their primary diet. You know, they're consuming it for fiber, for antioxidants to feed the gut microbiome, you know, for some nutrients, of course, but it's just, it's, it's this much, you know, rather than a full well, bowl. Here's my version of that. Uh-huh. It's like, you know what? One thing I can digest super well Dunkin' Donuts. Really (laughs) well. I have zero problem pulling nutrition out of those because just like a domestic dog, I have evolved the ability to break down the starch and sugar of which that stuff is primarily composed. But that doesn't mean I can do that without having it affect my body in other ways other than just providing it with some calories. Like imagine, like you can see how a domestic dog and by the way, like they, domestication generally is accepted to, to have occurred primarily during the advent of agriculture, when for the very first time in human history, we have a bunch of commodity crops that we're cultivating and they're around. They're becoming an increasingly large part of our diets. So you try to picture like, well, right around the same time, people and wolves are interacting and we're starting to engage in this selective breeding behavior or it's happening uh, naturally, even without our intention, where the more docile ones are around people more and more. And where it's kind of that you can see the first side of the dog wolf split developing the like temperamental psychological side of it starting to develop. But the other thing that's happening is the dogs that, or the wolves, excuse me, that have like a minor ability to produce amylase are living long. They're doing better because there's all that food available. And if you can pull some nutrition out of that, you don't have to worry about starvation as much. And so the selective pressure to develop that kind of quality starts to rise. It'll keep you alive longer. But that doesn't mean that you can, once you develop that quality, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have long-term chronic 
mm-hmm. disease implications. Like you can, your dog, yeah, your dog can digest starch. Absolutely. That's one of the things that makes it a dog. It just can't do that without a whole bunch of different things happening in its body. And those things, it turns out, have bad implications for its health. Yeah. Yeah. So like the ability to digest is like not a good proxy. You know, it's like I always use that example of people. It's like, I mean, I can digest cake. I can digest <laughs> soda, all that stuff. That doesn't, that's not like a good way of being like, that is a healthful decision. It doesn't yeah. suggest in any way, it's not logically linked to chronic disease risk to be like, well, they can digest it. I think I saw an article recently. It was actually by the Animal Wellness Magazine. And I wish I could remember the quote that was in it, but it turns out that this is something that's been constantly promoted um, recently. Well, I don't know if it's been recently, but um, a lot of people had that response to it. And in the article, it said something about the article was promoting a plant-based diet. They referenced a study of uh, 15 dogs over a 12-year period. And yep, they did great on a plant-based diet. So hey, everybody, you can feed your dog a plant-based diet. But then they um, talked about how it's not about, what was it? It's not about the ingredients. It's about the nutrients. Yeah. And it was just sort of like, okay, let's break that down. It's like that sentence on its own when you don't really think about it and you don't have any type of conception of, you know, canine nutrition, it does make sense. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's make sure they're getting the nutrients. But then when you think about, where those nutrients are coming from and what a dog system has to do to be able to convert and, and get the nutrients they need, you know, and the fact that with some of these brands out there, specifically the plant-based brands, they have to add so many um, synthetic nutrients to their recipes because clearly that plant isn't giving the dogs what they need, but the average individual doesn't understand any of that. So they just hear that sentence and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's just like you're giving yourself um, very little buffer is the bottom line. It's like you can in this day and age where we could put a man on the moon and split the atom and get uh, keto bread, like food scientists can do pretty cool things. And if, you know, there are millions of people that live every day as vegans and get in enough protein, it's hard to do that from just eating plant matter. You need to supplement, like in order to get enough protein to keep your body healthy, to grow your muscle mass, whatever, you need to take in a fair amount of it. And it's real hard unless you are very intentional and have access to a lot of different food products to do that without supplementation. And the same is, like you're saying, Kimberly, is exactly true on the doggy side. There are, if like in the same way that as a society, we're motivated to stop the spread of COVID. If we were motivated to put together a diet that would, using only plant sources, prevent a dog from developing any d- d- diseases of deficiency, we'd be able to do it. I 100% no problem. And like even the products that I don't know specific like plant based dog food companies, but like they even like you can see like, well, they, if they get it just right, you could just about do it. But it's just like, that's not the world that we always live in, where it's mm-hmm. like, it is the case that variations occur even within manufacturing. It's like, if that company misses it by just a bit on something, you end up with a deficiency disease. Like you're, to- you're balance. it's a balancing act. And so it's sort of the same thing there where it's like, it's so unnatural and you can hack Like in this day and age, it's not natural to fly to space, but like we as human beings have been able to engineer some pretty amazing things. And one of them is that despite the obscene amount of time that your dog's evolutionary ancestors spent eating meat and nothing else, if you do, it's not the case that you can't keep a dog alive without feeding him meat in this day and age. You can supplement with all kinds of crazy stuff, synthetic stuff, stay alive, pull calories out of it not develop a deficiency disease, but it's a, you are walking a tightrope and I don't know. Yeah. That's, it's, uh, it's obviously very unnatural as well. So it's like, you better have a very clearly thought through ethical stance, which in my judgment is not one that holds water, but those are the only, like if somebody comes to me and is like, as an ethical matter, I refuse to eat or feed my dog any meat material. So I'm going to do X, Y, and Z as a result of that. It's like, I can't really argue with that. I mean, I can highlight aspects of that that I totally disagree with, 
but it is what it is. Um, I don't even know. I'm digressing, I think. But like, yeah, it's, a, it's <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about the elephant in the room? Because I'm ready. I want to talk about well, it. I want to take, take us back to Daniel deciding to start this dog food company a couple years ago. And sort of, you know, the lay of the land at that time was the grain free diets were really kind of becoming really popular. You know, the the, the boutique exotic grain free, you know, landscape. So I'm sure you're went into this thinking like, oh, timing wise, I'm like getting in right at the right time, you know, for, for this. Uh, sort of. I mean, like I, um, I've never been persuaded that the evidence around um, like whether carbohydrates in a dog's diet come from grains or from some other abundant source of carbohydrates, such as like most commonly tubers is very persuasive on any particular health topic that like, if you feed a dog 50% of its calories from carbohydrate, you're not going to get very different health outcomes. If it's 50% corn versus 50% potatoes, like a non grain source of starch. And so I've never been like, like when we founded the company, I was like, okay, let's try to make the diet grain free. Cause there are lots of people out there that uh, uh, like think of that as a very important indicator of healthfulness. And I don't see anything wrong with it. Well, I'm trying to reduce the carbohydrate content overall as little as possible. But since there's this existing market, all right, let's just do that too. But we'll just make clear to people what I'm saying here, which is like, I don't really, nah, that's, that's nothing burger to me. So that was sort of the like, that's how I felt about it at the time I was like making the company and coming up with the initial recipes. But um, so, but in, in a way, right, that reflects the same reality that you're describing. It's like, I said, in essence, this is a really popular thing that a lot of people are buying into. So all else being equal, why don't we lean into that too? It's like, I'm not, that's not the idea of what makes us special or what's healthful about our foods, but it's so popular. Why not do it? So it's saying kind of the same thing as you, but I've never really been a believer in it, if that makes sense. Or I guess just that people like in the general public, were starting to maybe pay attention to something in their dog food. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to say that like this period of time, 2016 is when I published my book, there was more and more realization that the there was something wrong with the mainstream approach to keeping a dog healthy with its diet. That like what we had been doing for the to an increasing degree for the decades leading up to that, which is like more and more of the products made by the largest manufacturers that have the biggest inroads with the veterinary community more and more people were saying, this might be wrong, this might not be a good decision for me and my dog. And that's borne out in the economic data. Um, over that period of time, you can absolutely see an increase in the types of brands that you're describing and a decrease in some notable, what are they like to self uh, identify as traditional um, pet food brands. Which much like conventional medicine is not at all traditional, <laughs> and, you know animals so so you start your company and you know you're getting it off the ground and then there's this whole dcm thing <laughs> like how did this topic of dcm first come on to your radar oh i mean probably i mean i was running a pet food co this was the summer of uh 2018 is when the fda issued its uh like uh, announcement that it was beginning to investigate whether this big class of pet food products had any significance to the issue of dilated of TCM. And yeah, I, I mean, I can't remember originally how it came to me, but it was covered in the New York Times in a big article. It was covered in the Washington Post. Like that is legitimate national news when the leading public health agency says we're looking at whether this huge class of products that millions of citizens are, are using and feeding to their beloved pets is causing this deadly disease. That's national news. And when you have a pet, when you run a pet food company for a job and your friends know that they tend to put that stuff in front of you. And so I, I became aware of it very quickly. And my initial reaction to it was, oh, this smells weird. Like this is like I was initially very suspicious and skeptical that there was more than was being the kind of way it was reported in The Washington Post and uh, New York Times was like there really might be something here. And some good faith scientists 
are taking a look at this and seeing whether we're all really making this real thing happen that we, oops, we may have been doing this by mistake, thinking we were feeding healthier, but in reality doing something bad. And I read that and I recognize, like I had published a book about dog food already. I'd spent four years working on this. And like I, I alluded to before the fact that like the main scientific thesis of my book is carbs are very bad for dogs for a cluster of reasons. But there's like this big cultural side of it too, cultural thesis that is like the reason that more pet owners and the veterinary community don't recognize that carbohydrates have been shown to do all these nasty things is because they've increasingly fallen under the influence of powerful corporate organizations that are intending to try to hide that from them. And so like, I know that playbook, I had reported on it in depth. I know the people that are involved from my reporting, you reckon literally recognize names when I read the New York Times article. And so all those things led me to be like skeptical going into it. Moreover, I, like you said, I run one of the companies that the early reporting was saying like, hey, is your are your dog foods, Dan, given dogs DCM? And I felt very confident that no, they were not. And so that's a that's a tough thing to read in a huge national newspaper and start get, getting asked by your friends about. Um, and then third and finally, I know that like the uh, evidentiary record around important veterinary nutrition topics pretty well. I've written a book about this stuff. I've put together recipes that rely on that kind of stuff pretty well. I've written about this stuff extensively. And so I'm familiar with a lot of the issues. And I'm familiar with the body of scientific research on the issue of nutritionally mediated dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs. And there are just like a cluster of ways in which like that didn't wasn't like represented well in how the issue is being framed up in the investigation and the early reporting. And so like all that collectively was like, there's probably something more than meets the eye here. And I became interested. And so like over the course of becoming interested, I did a variety of things, but most notable thing that I did is um, because I, th that's my, I told Aaron about this before he started recording, but Kimberly, you didn't hear my St. Bernard, like does this, <laughs> all shaking when he gets like kind of ants in his pants and it's so loud he just did it. <laughs> working, probably. but um yeah one of the things that i knew about from having been trying to conduct a professional level journalistic exercise and from being paid to do the same thing in the legal community for a long time is i knew about this federal law called the freedom of information act freedom of information act is a law that says in essence if you tell the federal government, hey, show me all your records about this thing that you're doing with my tax money, they kind of have to give it to you. They're, but there are just a lot of exceptions to it. So like I can't ask them for Kimberly's Social Security number. I can't ask them for secrets of the, uh, I don't know, nuclear program or whatever, yeah. because there are c there are privacy considerations or there are confident like um, classified national security considerations, things like that. But unless it falls into one of those buckets. If you're willing to pay the government to make the records, they got to give it or copy the records. They got to give them to you. And so I was interested enough in this that I was like, I served the FDA. So like FDA, I want, here's my FOIA. They call it Freedom of Information Act is FOIA. Here's my FOIA request. Give me the whole DCM file. And they were basically like, nah, we don't think we have to. It falls into one of these exceptions. They said it was, this is an ongoing investigation, which it of course was because um, this would have been 2019. But not in the way, and that is actually an exception to FOIA. There's like, I can't, if I'm a defendant in a criminal case, or I can't like serve a FOIA request on law enforcement and be like, give me everything, like before I've been charged right. and just be like, oh, show me, I want to be in the room when you guys discuss this crime that you're investigating. Because no, it could compromise the investigation. This is different. This was like, they're investigating a novel scientific theory where they're trying to trace down does the evidence support this or not? It's not like there's a criminal culpability. And so it did, the exception didn't actually apply. They tried to say it did. I sued them in federal court. And ultimately, they changed their tune. And they started saying, okay, fine, we'll give you the whole uh, DCM file. And they started doing that. And it's big. And so every six weeks or so, I'd get a CD in the federal government. So I literally would get a CD containing another you know, thousand pages of redacted documents about DCM and how the investigation came into being. And that went on for three years. 
and they would just send me a new CD every four or six weeks. And I would sift through the documents and try to understand what they were saying and categorize poorly and just try to put together the story. And lo and behold, there is what I interpret as smoking gut evidence of fraud that is not reported uh, in any of the reporting that had been done about the DCM controversy to date. And so once I had that, it changed the, once I knew that, I saw that the evidence showed that it changed my like um, thought process, my belief from like suspicion and enough to like spend my weekends reviewing these documents to like, no, this is fraud. And I believe that if you see fraud and you don't say fraud, then you are a fraud. And I thought I had a duty to do it. And I thought that there are people being harmed by this, dogs being harmed by this. And so I started thinking about what to do with the evidence. And I'll pause there. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have so many things. My, my brain is exploding right now. It's old Kimberly before he did. Like I've been doing a lot of these interviews. I mean, since I published a book, but like particularly since this lawsuit began. And I've yet to have one where we reached the end of the allotted time and felt we had covered everything like. It's all, there's just a lot. And so I'm happy to come back on the show. Anytime you guys want, if you get good feedback from your listeners, we can split up whatever you want, yes. but like it's a 125 page lawsuit and it's serious. And it like, you, it's just hard to summarize quickly. Well, it's, it's one of those things where I remember the time when all of this was happening. And again, when people say thing, when a scientist says something and it sort of makes sense because that was the, the, what, clicked for me was, well, when you have grain free, they're adding legumes, legumes are an anti-nutrient. So that's blocking taurine. And that's why dogs were getting DCM. And so that made sense to me. However, I knew people who had raw fed dogs that were getting DCM. And so they would explain that away with, um, oh, well, that must be because of the breed. And and it just sort of like the argument started falling apart for me. And what really did it for me was, one, the names of the people who were speaking the loudest were also connected to companies that would benefit from this story. And that was when I basically learned to follow the money, that when you see a study, the first thing you do is look at the people behind the study and who they're connected to. So you can determine if this actually is a legitimate study. Two, the more studies came out with, the more, like, I started seeing mistakes. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Really blatant mistakes where, you know, there was one in particular where they said a brand that I'm very familiar with that's here local where I am had a pork recipe. And it's like, they have never had a pork recipe. And when I saw that, suddenly everything came out. Three was how aggressive people became. I mean, I'm a blogger. I don't know these veterinarians, but somehow they would find my blog and be commenting. Um, their followers would be saying just outrageously inaccurate information. And um, four, it didn't, it just went away. Something that was so crucial, no one speaks on anymore. And it's yeah. just, you know, that to me, I, I, I because of that situation, I now... I I wait and I ask questions. Doesn't sound like a bad approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like my news consumption. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the, you know, as, as the story evolved from the FDA's investigating this to everything that it would become, which is to say a priority, if not the priority for a, a huge number, I can't tell you off the top of my head what kind of number this is, but a huge number of professional veterinary people, like whether you're a clinical vet or you're a veterinary technician, a, a huge chunk of those people came to believe that number one, DCM should be the most or one of the most important health considerations in thinking about what you ought to recommend that a client feed its dog. And I know because uh, that... That would be even the case with regard to dogs that have other bad diseases where diet plays a significant role in managing the disease. So we make very low carbohydrate dog food products. You might, you guys probably know the disease diabetes is essentially the disease of being allergic to carbohydrate. Your body cannot process carbohydrate very well. It doesn't make enough of the hormone that's needed to process it, insulin. But because the veterinary nutrition community is such a 
you know, a wasteland, the standard of care dietarily for a dog with diabetes in America is to feed it a prescription only met- metabolic diet that's 40% digestible carbohydrate. So millions of people, that's exactly what they do. They get really poor outcomes with their dog with diabetes, not surprisingly. And if they learn about our product, they say, oh, I might want to give this a try. They give it a try. They inevitably have better outcomes every time. They end up using less insulin. Their dog's blood sugar is lower. And they go to the vet and they go, this thing you told me to do didn't work nearly as well as this other thing that I found out about. But it's great. I found it. Whatever. No problem. And I will get tickets and I get them to this day from people who go, yeah, the thing is, my vet told me DCM is a bigger, I should switch back anyway because I'm concerned Mm -hmm. about DCM. My dog has diabetes. I'm getting better outcomes, but still I should be more. So like, yeah. So, that's, yeah. that's, it's, it's strange to me that the FDA finally came out and said, yeah, we can't find any connection, but people are still talking about DCM. So, I mean, that's is this just basically, um, cause what I, what I didn't really understand is many of the companies that had grain kibble also had grain free. So I, what was the end game here? Well, our loss. So one of the things we haven't really like, we kind of, we're talking about this lawsuit, but just to be clear for anybody that's listening that like, isn't aware of this. Ultimately, once I got these FOIA records that showed that there were these undisclosed, like not publicly reported facts about how the investigation came to be that involved fraud, I tried to think about whether anybody should be held accountable for that fraud, whether anybody was liable for the damage that it caused, because it had caused a bunch of damage to folks, not least of which companies like mine that mm-hmm. make products that millions of folks came to believe increase the risk of DCM, but actually don't. And so I put together, I used to be a lawyer, I put together this big, massive, I spent years working on this complaint that like spells out everything about how this whole from the misconduct involving the FDA to other things that are completely inappropriate for veterinarians to be doing and uh, reached out to some lawyers and started saying like, is this a, is uh, based on what you know about the law, is this a, like a valid cause of action? Does this evidence support uh, us being able to like hold somebody accountable for this? And they're like, yes. And so in February of this year, we filed a, big class action lawsuit where Keto Natural Pet Foods is the putative class representative. And we filed it against Hills Pet Nutrition, which is the number one vet, self-proclaimed number one vet, vet recommended brand in the United States. Two nonprofit organizations that are affiliated with Hills. They're both named after the founder of Hills. And five veterinarians that, like Kimberly would say, if you follow the money, they're mm-hmm. affiliated with Hills as well through financial contribution. Um, And we allege, in essence, that they fabricated the DCM controversy by, among other, intentionally and through, among other strategies, by misleading the FDA um, into launching its investigation. And um, how did I get, how did I get started on like reference, just like making sure people understand that like, that's kind of the, we never said it explicitly. So like that's, that's sort of the the reason that it's interesting for you guys to interview me today, right? So, and why and why were the documents even redacted? I mean, it's oh, not like there, no. I mean, look, there are valid. Like, let's say one of the case. This is an example that's not real. If it, mm-hmm. if one of the case reports about like one of the things they gave me was all the case reports that came in with dog with DCM was eating this food came in on this date. Da, 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 all that stuff. If it had like. Kimberly, your name on it, okay. they would act that out because there's a privacy concern. Okay. But there's like, that's one, that's an example of a much bigger list of valid applications. And so, yeah, there's, you have, when you get into FOIA litigation, you can either like fight individual redactions or just like accept them. And so mm-hmm. some of them were problematic. Some of them didn't seem to be, I didn't never like waived the objection to them, but yeah, that's why. Okay. So- uh, I had told Daniel, you know, just from what I do professionally, uh, this is extremely well researched and well written, and just I could just read it for days. And <laughs> I was so excited. And that impressed. warms my heart. You don't hear that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's a, uh, yeah, that warms my old lawyer heart. I definitely, once it was filed, I was like my old colleagues that I worked with at the firm, including my old boss. I was like, 
check out. <laughs> you know I mean? Fishing for that compliment. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, but yeah, I thought so. I mean, it's, it's like I was involved with one other like relatively like nothing in pet food is ever particularly high profile except for the DCM controversy. But like I was involved in one other like quasi high profile pet food thing also regarding DCM a few years before filing this suit. I tried to get a very particularly problematic article retracted from Javma. Uh, you guys are probably familiar. It played a big role in the controversy. It's discussed in our complaint in the lawsuit at length. And they should never have published it. It was never peer reviewed. It was had false information in it, a bunch of things. And I thought if I could make enough of a stink about it, they actually would retract it because the journal had some reasons why it was incentivized not to retract it. But I thought, look, if enough people recognize what's wrong with this and start demanding this, they're, they're, they might cave. And so I tried to get that done because it was so damaging. And um, ultimately, I failed. They didn't do it. Um, but when I did that, um, as you've experienced, like you alluded to, Kimberly, like I got a ton of vitriol, personal, like social media. And uh, anytime I'd like write something that would appear somewhere, I'd get nasty stuff in there. And it was, you, you, you know, you can't try to give people the benefit of the doubt. You try to understand where they're coming from. But like some of it's inexcusable. Some of it's good faith. Some of it's nasty, some of it's polite, but like it was a real thing to deal with. And I was like sort of, I and remain like mentally prepared to deal with that in an even larger scale by filing this lawsuit, right? Like it's scary to file this big lawsuit against a big company that has huge inroads with a community that I care about a lot, the veterinary community. Oh, they're all going to hate me. What? And I'll tell you what, it looks really different now. It's like there has not been that same kind of and I've done more. I've gotten more like media attention is more interesting than the earlier thing. And it's not like that. And I think one of the reasons why is like you can't whether or not we win this lawsuit will be determined in the years ahead. There's a lot to it. You can prove every fact in there and there might still be a reason why we lose the lawsuit. Or we could prove none of the facts that we allege in there and lose a lawsuit over that. We could get some of the people that are defendants in the lawsuit held liable, others not. All kinds of different outcomes. But like you can't look at that and go, nah, this is just some nothing. This is not substance. This is just BS. Like, no, 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 no. Take five, spend five minutes leafing through that, and you can see that this is deadly serious and full of serious evidence. And so I think that's a big part of the reason why it's just like, you don't have much you can say about that. So for our listeners, I'll make sure that I put a link in the show notes so that they can download the complaint, because even if they're not legal nerds like me, um, <laughs> there's so much fascinating just information and background and giving like the lay of the land with like the big pet food companies. And, you know, one of the things, Kimberly, like that we've talked about before, right, is how the veterinary schools are like. Mm -hmm. corporate funded. And so there was actually like this um, quote from in the complaint that's like, you know, gives all the background allegations and you know, documentations and citations that like a leading veterinary textbook is edited by two Hills employees and is dedicated to the founder of the Hills Pet Nutrition Company. It has their logo on the back. It's like, if you flip the book over, it says, it's like got the Hills logo on it. It's like as if McDonald's was on the doctor's textbook. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, you know, it's just fine. it just gives all the, the citations for everything that we kind of know and explains. Um, and honestly, like, you know, and all of this, in my opinion, anyway, is like a metaphor for the pharmaceutical industry for people, the, you know, the, the food industry, the big ag industry for people like to understand like the interplay of like how there's these nonprofit organizations that are all industry funded. And then they put these studies out and, you know, gets on the news. And anyway, it just it, it is mind blowing. Like it would take us three episodes to really cover everything. Yeah, it probably well, would take us. I think long. that the thing that astounds me is that they, I will admit, um, are pretty brilliant. And I think this just goes to marketing where they know their customer base and they know just basically the human psyche. We as a species have become so lazy. You know, I think about, you know, I'm, I'm in my early fifties now, 
But when I was a kid, we still had debate class and we had civics class and, you know, where and we had to prove our points, whereas I find today on social media, people will say something when you ask them for their their support for what they're saying. They either get offended that how dare you insinuate that I'm not telling the truth or they'll just say, oh, so and so said it. And that's supposed to be sufficient enough. And I laugh because, I mean, I can imagine turning in a report that says, oh, well, so-and-so said this. And so that's my support, how that would go off with my teachers when I was younger. But one thing that I love, and I just want to read this um, because it sums it up perfectly, is that the FDA's DCM investigation garnered a storm of mainstream media coverage over its first 12 months, causing an immediate and steep decline in the demand for non-traditional dog foods. But the investigation never actually turned up any link between the disease and the targeted products. More than five years on, the FDA's investigation has still found no evidence that non-traditional dog foods play any role whatsoever in causing or exacerbating canine DCM. And we see this in so many areas of our world today. Like where the, the popularity of the initial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And people focus on, you know, like, you know, where they say um, anecdotes of, and yes, this does happen, but of, you know, a report coming out and, saying something that's completely un, you know fabricated and wrong and then they come back and they they don't even bo- today they don't even bother correcting it but if there is a correction it's on page 27 at the very bottom in small print but no, everyone focuses on those initial headlines i mean again it's like the damage was done yeah well yeah so so part of my reaction when i hear this stuff is like i i have a great deal of sympathy for lay pet owners that never put themselves in a position to like read the actual science on DCM um, and got misled. Mm-hmm. I don't think that Joe Blow, average dog owner that works as a engineer, has the time to like, that's not how that's not an efficient use. Like site doesn't work that way. You go to your experts, which means yeah. like go to media platforms that have through the years and through whatever other infrastructure have developed the credibility to tell the truth. You know, you go to the scientific community, they have guardrails that ensure that they're telling the truth. You go to the people that you think of as experts, you go to your clinician, they have their guardrails that help ensure that they have the tell the truth. So like, I never really, I get the phenomenon you're talking about and it's, it is real. It's like where people see, they see the link on social media, they believe it, they don't take the time to read it. But I like, I sympathize. It's a, it's a pickle. It's a tough thing that is like companies have figured out a way to like powerful folks have figured out a way to take advantage of it Yeah, and it's there yeah. to be done. And we're going to have to figure that out as a society to get better at it. But, and here's the big, but I do not have that level of sympathy for the practicing veterinary community. Mm-hmm. I have personal friends that are veterinarians, a lot of them. I encounter tons and work with tons. The very first investor in our company is a veterinarian. To say they dropped the ball so badly here that you can't just be like, I sympathize. It's like that's their job is Mm -hmm. to serve as that guardrail. And so many got it so wrong where basic scientific literacy, where 101 level stuff would have revealed a lot. It wouldn't have maybe been able to like pick out that there was fraud behind this, but you do not have to be. Um, you know, Albert Einstein, Oppenheimer, you don't have to be Robert <laughs> Oppenheimer to piece together what was wrong with the DCM science. You had to do a good faith, literate, skeptical read. And that that didn't happen on a population level is something the vet- veterinary community is going to have to deal with for years to come. It should be a motivation to, for self-examination. It should be yeah. like, a whoa, 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 whoa. We let this happen. What else are we letting happen and how do we go about doing it? Are we just going to keep doing this and let the next one happen? Um, so yeah. yeah I, and this I, should make us even more concerned about the number of pet food companies that are now managing veterinarian clinics. Oh my God. It's a, whole, it's a recipe for disaster. That is, it's the perfect storm of this happening again and again, because yeah. they're telling them, you know, they're already telling them, you know, you can only spend this much time with a a client, 
I couldn't imagine if my veterinarian kicked me in and out when I have a problem. It's like, we need to sit down and figure out what's going on with my dog. And we can't do that in 15 minutes. And, you know, so, but something like this, where we have veterinarians that are facilitating fraud and telling us, you know, in a big way, they had a huge group. They had so many people brainwashed. If you even suggested that, I'm not sure about this. They lost their minds until people were silenced. And and like you said, it was in all of the headlines. And the story, when you didn't really did dive deep into it, if you just read the article, it's like, okay, well, yeah, this this makes sense. Yeah. And And I feel like it planted a seed that will not go away because people still, it, people, most people who saw the DCM rise, they didn't see the FDA come out and say, we haven't found a connection. Yeah, it's uh, I'm still trying to get my arms around the present state of like a, a nuanced read of how exactly different communities are presently, how you can characterize their beliefs about this. That's like a, that's an interesting subject because it's changing in real time, right? Like mm-hmm. this lawsuit is in its own little minor way, a matter of public importance. And it got reported in plenty of places. We're talking about it on your very interesting podcast today. And like, it's going to change people's perspectives to some degree. How that all shapes things over time remains to be seen. But I find that interesting too, because it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, this is maybe too in the weeds, but like, it's just so fascinating how different communities are susceptible to different information. Like, yeah. That I can make inroads with pet owners reasonably effectively, as long as they're scientifically literate folks, by explaining the kinds of things that I'm explaining to you guys today, making myself available for inter- uh, intelligent people like yourselves to ask me questions about it and trying to do my best to explain it. Doing that in the veterinary community is so different. And it's not because of the level of scientific rigor or seriousness that's being brought to this, because if like the 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 place where it doesn't happen is the lack of engagement in the first instance like the number of places that the the average joe blow veterinarian or veterinary technician goes to and trusts for information on informa- on stuff that's significant to their professional practice is super limited and the like because it's so limited very few folks can control it really effectively. And it makes it very difficult for me to get the same level of engagement with the exact same material. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you have this interesting exercise and just like how propaganda works more or less. Yeah. uh, um, So I know we have to wrap it up here, but can you, is there a way to briefly tell us uh, exactly how this issue was brought to the FDA in the first place? To Absolutely. get them interested in investing. Super important. Yeah. yeah. So the like one the the what I refer to as like the smoking gun evidence of fraud that kind of gave rise to the suit is evidence that so the FDA when it announced its investigation and thereafter said to the public, look, we're doing this because we got a spike in cases of dogs that have DCM that were all eating what appears to be similar diets. Um, We got a spike in cases and they never said to the public, here's what we mean by a spike. This is uh, this is where they all came from. And so if you are the public, that sounds like what you want your public health agency doing. Well, wait a second. You got a bunch of disconnected people from all around the country who sent in a bunch of the same issue all at the same time. That does look suspicious. You should go investigate that. But it relies on a couple of facts that actually aren't borne out in the truth. What really happened here is not that a whole bunch of different people scattered around the country told the FDA, hey, you should look at DCM in this food product all at once. What happened is that only 28 cases got submitted to the FDA. And that's kind of like, oh, that's not much of a spike. Uh-huh. 28 cases gave rise to this. There's 70 million dogs in the United States. Moreover, All 75% of those cases, 21 out of 28, came from just two people. They didn't just come from a cluster or from an unrelated cluster (laughs) of folks all around the country. They came from two people. 
that are now defendants in the lawsuit of Tufts veterinary nutritionist named Lisa Freeman and another one who's moved universities a little bit, whose name is Darcy Aiden. And they collected cases and submitted them to the FDA. So that's publicly uh, non-reported fact number one, which is like, wait a second, that's not what I thought happened. If you're just like Joe Blow reading the uh, reporting on DCM. But it's not smoking gun. That's not smoking gun, really. Like they are veterinarians. Of course, they should be in the business of telling the FDA about stuff that they're concerned about health wise. What's smoking gun is that you also see in the documents that they didn't just report every dog that had DCM to the FDA. They cherry picked the cases for those involving the kinds of diets that were made by folks other than the folks paying them. And they sent those cases to the FDA, whereas the ones made by the companies that were financially backing them didn't get sent to the FDA. Wow. And that is fraud. That, that is, is how you get gold. an organization to lo- like the public health organization to launch this investigation that ultimately turned nothing up. And that wasn't borne out until the documents uh, that were produced to me. And you have to pair it up even with some, in the case of Dr. Aiden, it's like it, some of the evidence comes from, she did a series of poster presentations pertaining to DCM and, and wrote a series of articles pertaining to DCM right around the same time. And we had to do some detective work relating to like, well, how many cases was she aware of at this point involving DCM and dogs fed traditional diets? How many dogs and kind of tie all that back together? And that's a general way of describing a really like intricate fact pattern that like shows that she clearly didn't submit dozens of cases of DCM that she knew about involved uh, dogs that were being fed tra- uh, traditional diets. So that's kind of the thing that kicked it all off. It wasn't a publicly reported fact until I got those documents through FOIA. And yeah, I believe that that's fraud and I'm hopeful that the court will agree with me. Well, I will definitely be following this very closely and uh, thank you so much for being here today. I feel like we're probably going to have to come on and have a part two at some point in the future. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like, there's a couple things. Number one, if you uh, literally call me after the show and we can set up, we can just pick up the conversation. I, I love doing this, as you can probably tell. Um, at, but the other thing is litigation is not a fixed moment in time. Like right now, the media that's being conducted is like guy filed lawsuit. And that's an interesting story. But it's not going to be the last story here. There's going to be other interesting things that are going to happen throughout the lawsuit. And evidence pertaining to it, how the court views these things, what the other side says. So there's going to be events throughout time. So that's another like uh, that will inevitably lead to being in touch. You know, there'll be something new to talk about in all likelihood. Yeah, I'm down. <laughs> Thank you so much. For being so verbose. Like when I get into this stuff that I like feel like I know a lot of uh, unique information about. It becomes very like the fire hose of information. So I apologize. We love it. It's why we have a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I mean, I think it's a remind. It's a. It's important to remember that you know we still have to ask questions. Unfortunately, it's like we have reached a point where we can't always just trust the headlines. You know, we need to look further and follow the money because you know that's that this was such an example of that yeah you want to know what i believe that's like it falls in the same bucket of like a good rule of thumb that can help you uh, help calibrate your suspicion detector your bs detector when you get new information is like how amenable are the sources of the information to being questioned Mm -hmm. You, you know what i'm saying like if you look into the dcm matter you will find with rigorous consistency that the main folks who are involved in promoting the false idea that BEG diets produce CCM and dogs were really good about not putting themselves in a place to have to answer questions publicly. They put out a lot of information that was not subject to being questioned by folks who are raising valid questions. And so that is, I always believe is like, it doesn't prove anything, but it's a reason to be suspicious. And it's one of the reasons why I'm going out of my way to try to make myself so available to answer questions like the ones you guys are raising today, because I think it helps demonstrate how serious I am about this and what, what I truly believe about it. And what the evidence, like, I think it can withstand questions and scrutiny. And uh, so, yeah. I, 
I wish I had the graphic handy, but there was a graphic that I saw on social media a month or so ago that says if they're deleting the comments, if they're blocking and banning people, you know, that's when you need to start being suspicious. It's like when they refuse to answer questions, I mean, especially when they're delivered respectfully and politely, um, if they're exactly. attacking you back and or you know, deleting comments, you know, that's one of those things where maybe they aren't, they don't have the best of intentions. Maybe yeah, something is going on. If folks that are, if anybody that's listening is like seriously sitting down to read 125 compl- page <laughs> complaint about dog food, there is a big part of it that deals with the main Facebook group and the associated website that was tied to that Facebook group and the role played by that in the broader conspiracy involving DCM. And I think it's a got, fascinating you know, it's interesting I have call. it up. I, I'm going to print it out because I'm like really, and in, I'm interested in this. Yeah. <laughs> that's so. an interesting part of it. It's like, it's, it got brought to my attention through like, or like the significance of it. It's like some of the, you know, this is such a pervasive problem. This like corporate influence in science that produces bad yes. public health outcomes is so pervasive that it's now studied by academics where that that's their area of expertise is misinformation science, basically. And these folks, super interesting professors wrote a super interesting book from UC Irvine called The Misinformation Age. And they talk at length about the significance, not of social media as a general phenomenon, but particularly the use of these like groups, subgroups within broader platforms like this Facebook group that ended up playing such a big role in DCM because there's moderation and control that can take place by the moderators of the group that ends up having a big impact on the folks who are just stumbling into it in a way that broader stuff on the platform doesn't have. And so, yeah. And can I just share one more thing and then we can end. So I had a friend of mine who is an expert in cardiology for humans. And he also is the owner of a raw dog food company. So at the time he, he and I talked a lot about this and he wrote an article for my blog and um, Dr. Joshua Stern commented And he said, this article demonstrates not even the most basic understanding of canine heart disease or the issue at hand of nutritionally mediated DCM. Read virtually anything by any actual scientist for a better understanding of this disease. This disclosure at the bottom of this article don't even come close to covering the dangers and accuracies of this blog. And it was just like, and that's one of the defendants in this lawsuit for everyone. Yes, is a defendant in this lawsuit. And Thus far, you know, you go around answering questions about it and and you, uh, about the lawsuit and more and more people learn about it. And it turns out that the people that learn about it have had their own experiences with that are significant, that are t- like stem from the same facts as underlie the litigation. And uh, candidly, a, more than anything else, the stories that have been told to me by folks are like, just in case this is useful or somewhat useful in some kind of way in the litigation is folks who are saying like, I had this interaction with Josh Stern and here's what he did to me. And that's happened multiple times. And so. Oh my gosh, Daniel. Thank you so much for your time today. Welcome. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Uh, I hope I talk to you guys again. 